is up everyone welcome back to my youtube channel today we will be reacting to what exactly is an indie car as i reacted to um what exactly is a sprint car and then everyone was like oh you should do all these videos that are also from the slap shoes channel and someone said i should do the indie car one which i did want to get into anyway because i've started reacting to indie car and i'm enjoying it very much so with that being said let's just get straight into it but before we do that make sure you subscribe over half of you that are watching my videos it's not subscribed just hit the bell it takes two seconds and if you'd like to become a member of my channel and receive exclusive perks you can also do that by hitting the join button down below right i'm very excited let's get into it it's the month of may and that means the indy 500 is right around the corner it's one of the oldest and most historic ongoing it's races in may. america <laughs> And not just that, it's one of the largest in-person live sporting events, not just in the country, but in the entire world. I can't wait on to watch the last Sunday of May, nearly 300,000 people descend on this two and a half and mile track to watch 33 so drivers go to war for 500 miles. And it draws in millions more viewers on TV to boot. But here's the thing though, despite this massive event headlining the entire IndyCar season, you'll be hard pressed to find a random person off the street who can name more than two drivers, name another track on the schedule, or even explain what an IndyCar is. Yeah, I can't do How any can of those How can such a three. large sporting event exist without people even having the most <laughs> basic understanding of its sanctioning body? At one point, Formula One cars and IndyCars were the same. At one point, the Indy 500 was part of the Formula One schedule. IndyCars yeah, and Sprint cars used to be nearly identical. All that, and I haven't even talked about the kart IndyCar split where we had two IndyCar series in America. What? Yeah, that's about clear as mud. So let's get more in depth with all this and explain a little bit more because the IndyCar series deserves its fair shake. There were five entrants and the race was held in snowy conditions in November for some inexplicable reason. And after more than 10 hours, the Duryea brothers, Charles and Frank, claimed victory in their own custom built car. Look at Auto racing cars. in America was here to stay. The first Would you even call that car? Or horseless carriages as they were known at the time were <clears> open wheeled cars meaning that they didn't have enclosed fenders, a feature still found on IndyCar and Formula One cars today. And although car manufacturers did exist, most of the time they just sold you the car and no body. It was up mm. to you to either build one or order a body from somebody else. So two 1901 Buicks might be built wow. in the same factory, but look radically different. The American Automobile Association, or AAA, would organize the first competitive season in American motorsports in 1905. And boom, there it is. IndyCar now has a sanctioning body, but nobody called them IndyCars yet. Back then, they were known as Champ Cars. And yes, this does come into play later, like okay. 100 years <clears throat> later. And the final race of the year was a 480-mile rally-style race from LA to Phoenix, Arizona. And that lasted 19 hours. However, wow. one track on the schedule was a real game changer, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. This two and a half mile track was paved with bricks and was ridiculously fast by the standards of the day. Where most tracks would have an average race speed in the 20s, maybe the 30s if they were lucky, Indy had average speeds well into the 70s. Wow. But the races were not 500 miles just yet. They had some 100, 200, and 300 mile events, but in 1911, track promoters decided not to have just a few smaller races sprinkled throughout the year, but just to have one big event. Just Thus, even the like Indianapolis 500 the was born. Evolution. But they didn't call it that just yet. At first, it was marketed as the 1911 like International 500 mile sweepstakes race. But Indy 500 Crazy. had a substantially better ring to it, so that name stuck. <clears throat> Ray Haroon and his souped up Marmon Wasp took the checkered flag, and little did he know it, but he had just kicked off an entire century of racing tradition. Look Ray had won with an average speed of just 74 miles an hour in a race that took nearly seven hours. Wow. And he won handedly because of one simple breakthrough. He had a single seat car. Every other car at the time was a two seater and a mechanic would ride along with the driver and fix any problem the car had right there on the track. Sometimes wow. even while it was still racing. But if oh nothing God. was wrong with the car, the mechanic would manually pump oil into the car while on the straightaways and spot for the driver. And this then led to the rise of a different form of racing where people could race cars taken straight off the showroom floor. Stock car racing. Y'all probably know all about that. The yeah. AAA stopped sanctioning IndyCar races in 1956, and USAC, the United States Auto Club, took over running the series. Throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s, IndyCar racing had perhaps the most diverse racing schedule in the world featuring races in the US and Canada, and racing on paved super speedways, dirt one-milers, street courses, purpose-built road courses, and even having the Pikes Peak hill page. climb on the calendar for a long while. Sorry, they really did it all. But as the 60s rolled into the 70s, one major advancement and something from the past caused a rift. In 1965, Jim Clark won at Indy in a rear-engine Lotus car. The rear-engine cars were lower to the ground and way faster than their front-engine counterparts. And the design of choice moving forward was clearly going to be some sort of rear engine configuration for paved ovals and road courses. However, IndyCars still raced on dirt. 
and that was the one area where front engine cars still had the advantage. So in 1970, IndyCar ran its last dirt race at the California State Fairgrounds in Sacramento. However, some drivers remained dirt loyalists, and those purpose-built Indy dirt cars would eventually morph into sprint cars. And that would not be the last split in IndyCar racing, not by a long shot. By 1979, some of the teams began to disagree with the way USAC was running things. Drivers and team owners felt as though USAC just didn't care about their concerns regarding safety, costs, and a litany of other issues. Okay. So in 1979, a large group of teams and drivers split to form CART, Championship Auto Racing Teams. The Indy 500 was still sanctioned by USAC, as they had an alliance with the Holman family who now owned the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, after they had saved it from falling into disrepair after World War II. This sort of odd scenario caused an even greater rift between the teams and the Speedway. For decades, CART ran a whole season, and then the Indy 500 just so happened to be in the middle of their calendar. It was like if the NFL didn't own the rights to the Super Bowl and instead the USFL ran that, but the results still counted towards your season. It just made no sense. What made matters even worse was that Indianapolis made the rules for the Indy 500, not CART. So sometimes a car that was within specifications for every other race of the year would be illegal running during the biggest race of the year. Wow. Roger Penske had dumped <clears throat> millions in developing wicked fast V8 Elmore motors, only to be told in 1994 that those motors would not be allowed to race in the Indy 500. Penske had what? basically spent millions on what were now the world's most expensive paperweights. Tony George, the grandson of Tony Holman, who had saved the Indy Motor Speedway, trademarked the term IndyCar and announced in 1995 that the next year they would form the Indy Racing League. USAC would no longer sanction the Indy 500, instead the IRL would take that duty. While the IRL would be a completely different series with an emphasis on cost controls, CART and the IRL would compete against each other at this one race, which would count towards the championship points for both series. However, another rule change Tony George put in place would effectively kill off any CART involvement at Indy, the 25-8 rule. The IRL stipulated that the Indy 500 must consist of at least 25 IRL teams and only 8 CART teams could make the race. Okay. CART understandably said absolutely no way and went and made their own race, the US 500 at Michigan International Speedway, which was to be held on the same day at the same time as the Indy 500. <laughs> Since this is probably the first time you've ever heard of the US 500, you can probably guess who won out in this situation. Yeah. CART billed itself as having the faster cars, the best drivers, but before even taking the green flag for the first ever US 500, <gasps> nearly the entire field crashed out, and yeah. teams were told to pull out their backup Look cars. All the wheels After a lengthy off. red flag, everybody had changed the channel to the Indy 500, where out of a 33-car field, 17 of which were rookies, Buddy Lazier won in dramatic fashion. For the first time in decades, there were empty seats at Indy and hotels were not even close to being completely booked. Wow. The split had caused both leagues to shrink drastically, and CART was in such bad shape that they were having to pay networks to air their races instead of the <sighs> other way around. CART eventually declared bankruptcy and was reorganized as Champ Car in the early 2000s, okay. since that's what they were known as all the way back in 1905. Mm. However, after just one race in the spring of 2008, Champ Car announced they would merge with IndyCar and finally unify after a 12-year split. But wow. by then, the damage was done and the newly rechristened IndyCar series was still suffering. However, an old friend would come to save it in its most desperate hour. The NTT IndyCar series hosts races all over the US, racing everywhere from the streets of Nashville to St. Petersburg, Florida, to road course races in Portland where it all began. It has nearly a century of history backing it, and nearly every motorsport in the world can trace some part of its ancestry to it. The Darlington Raceway of NASCAR fame was built because it was inspired by Indy. Daytona is 2.5 miles long because of Indy. Sprint cars are just old dirt Indy cars. Mm. Formula One has single seat open wheeled cars because IndyCar proved yep. the concept. <clears throat> like it or not, this is where it all began and we owe more to these cars in this series than we could ever possibly pay back. A few moments later. Yeah, it was very interesting to find out like the origins of IndyCar and where it all began. I do love learning like the history behind um, where like each motorsport came from so that was very interesting and yeah i did enjoy that video so with that being said if you have any other videos that you'd like me to react to drop them in the comments i'm working my way through everybody's suggestions at the moment if you did want to check out any of my other socials they are all linked down below and if you wanted to become a member on my channel and receive exclusive perks then you can also do that by hitting the join button down below but i hope you enjoyed today's reaction and i will catch you next time for the next one bye